Hello and you're very welcome to the British and the JMAC podcast. I'm John Mann and of course this podcast is sponsored by orgoretro.com. Use my promo code JMAC podcast to get 15% off on the website. And as you can uh, see, uh, Gary with the uh, lovely, lovely Leitrim jersey um, that I started out with a couple of months ago. So if you want any interest in that, uh, use my promo code to get 15% off on it. And today, of course, I'm joined by a good pal of mine, uh, Gary, to uh, preview and review the weekend's game and uh, talk about the trials and tribulations and everything that went on and so on and so forth. So Gary, my good man, how's tricks? Hey John, not too bad. Uh, lick, lick, licking my wounds, licking my wounds the last couple of days, but uh, yeah, wasn't 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 a great weekend for anyone from Leitrim. Or England. Or England, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I have to call you out something to see this week. Do you feel sorry for England? I, I agree, I agree, I agree with a lot of stuff you say, Gary, but just not that one. <laughs> but see, my argument for that, John, is right, and this is this is what I find hilarious about all this. I actually like that that group of players. The majority of them I like. Um I don't agree with Kane and Sterling and these boys throwing themselves down and lads will claim that Jack Grealish does the same. I don't think he does, but um I actually like the group of players. I don't mind Southgate either. Um I just think it's the media and the fans that turns everybody against the English. So what you know, when I seen the the I seen the boys at full time and I was laughing at lads on my own Twitter feed no more than your own kind of slating them and then these are the same lads in, in six weeks time when the Premier League starts will be uh, whinging when they don't get a decision for some of them English, same English players playing for their team so I just look I would I by no means you know I was quite happy in the end when they lost but also don't get this kind of hatred I know the the old 800 years of pain and all that but like we we all majority of us support teams across the water, so I don't know why we want them to fail so badly. But I was delighted Italy won in the end. I think they've been the best team in the tournament anyway. Uh, yeah, definitely they, they they were definitely one of the better teams anyway. But obviously Italy came out and uh, top, and it's coming Rome, Gary. And um, I suppose just kind of t- t- touching on that, um, it was it seemed to be maybe the media that hyped up the English press and the English team as well. So and the fans obviously kind of letting themselves down after the game. I suppose Gary. So I suppose the English maybe the players are okay. Well, okay, maybe Barrett, Dick and Rice and Grealish and some of the boys there. But <laughs> it just did. It did seem to be the fans that did that to the side down, Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before and after, John. I mean, you could see that boiling up. I think we all could know. I've been out to Wembley the last couple of years actually for the playoff finals and and the Carabao Cup final when Villa made it. And, it's a brilliant experience. I had, a, I had a great experience when I was there, but um, you could see it building up down Wembley Way early on. I mean, there was videos going around on social media that morning at nine o'clock, of lads out of it um, in London city centre. So you had a feeling it was heading that way. And it's just unfortunate that along with that, as you said, they, they always go around crying as to why nobody else likes them. But I mean, you can't blame them when you see that. And it continues, whether they're abroad or whether they're at home, it continues to happen. So um, heart of sympathy from that point of view. And I think they've all but uh, um, vetoed our joint 2030 World Cup bid as well. I'd say that's down to Swanee as well. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, I know, geez, it would have been absolutely brilliant to get it, but it's looking very unlikely at this stage. And yeah. so, as Gary, we can uh, touch on to the weekend's action just gone in. You had action in the Munster Championship, the Ulster Championship, the Connacht Championship, and of course, the uh, Ulster Championship once again on Sunday. But we can crack into the uh, Munster Championship uh, to start it all off. You had uh, Limerick against Cork. So, uh, Cork went in this game 116 to Limerick's 11 points. And um, I know there's a lot said about this Cork team. I know they, get, they have the critics, but I was watching back the Sunday game and by God, Gary, they play some decent football. They do, they play decent football. I suppose Limerick, we said we knew who Limerick would set up, John, you know, a little bit more defensively. Um, you know, uh, that Limerick team has been building for quite a while now. Um, and they have some lovely footballers. Uh, very good. Ian Corbett at six there is a great player. Um, but they kind of set up their fall early on that they weren't going to allow Cork to play through them. And uh, you're right, some of the scores Cork took were lovely. But I think... They tagged on five or six points, John, in the last 10 minutes from what I watched of it. And I'm thinking it kind of put a gloss on the scoreline because there was only a kick of the ball in it for the majority of the game. I watched a good bit of the first half and a good part of the second, j- jumping over and back between games. And um, it just, there was no real tempo or real intensity to the game. And I think that's the way Limerick wanted to play it. Limerick wanted to suck the life out of Cork, drag them into a bit of a dogfight and see where they're within a within a kick of the ball with 15 minutes to go and they were you know it, it worked 
for the majority of the game. But I suppose Cork's extra fitness and probably extra quality off the bench told out in the end. They kicked some lovely scores. I know Her- Michael Hurley came on and played well and had an impact. And there was a couple of more there as well. Ian Maguire in the middle is a great bit of stuff as well, the captain. So Cork's quality is there. It's never been doubted, John. But as we've spoken on this programme a good few times before, it's just getting that quality out of them on a consistent basis. They, we compared them earlier in the year. Kildare and Cork, I think, played in the first round of the league. I was on with you. Two very similar counties and very similar teams. Absolutely loads of footballers there, but just don't seem to be able to put it on a consistent basis. So um, they'll see where they're at, I think, in the, in the Munster final. Obviously, everyone will be back in Kerry. They won't be caught in the hop this year again. But it'll be interesting to see how Cork set up for that one as well. But yeah, uh, Limerick... Probably went 45, 50 minutes of the game. It went the way they wanted to go. They just didn't have that little bit of quality in the end to, to put Cork under any real pressure. They never looked like losing it, you know? Yeah, 100%. And I suppose kind of touching on Cork as well, Gary, how important is the kind of, kind of bill for this final against Kerry? Because they did play some nice brand of football. We are crying out for a strong, strong Cork team. We haven't really seen them have much success since that 2010 All-Ireland win in um, the All-Ireland. So, you know, how much... Like how much confidence can they take for beating this uh, I suppose this enough Limerick team, Gary? Yeah, and uh, look, as you said, they're building nicely. I mean, they wanted to kind of maybe get a few miles in the legs this weekend at a, at a championship pace. The pace of the game wasn't there for a long time, which would have suited Limerick more, and that's the way they wanted to play. But Cork, all all the same, that could have been a game they would have lost maybe two or three years ago. So maybe they're building something nicely, as you say. Um, I mean, the way they played last year against Kerry, it went exactly the way they wanted it to, and that's why O'Connor was there at the end. They just wanted to be within a kick of the ball come the end against Kerry last year, and that's how it worked out. They'll take that again. Uh, I'm sure John probably will be whenever the Munster final is, but I think Kerry are a lot more alive to it than they were last year. Kerry never looked like getting out of third gear, and they didn't even bother. So um, you never know. I don't think they're going to catch Kerry on, on the hop again like they did last year, um, but as you said, I think it's more long-term plan. They're looking at maybe trying to progress to Division 1 and maybe get a bit closer to Kerry, even though we're saying that, having them beaten them in the, in the Munster final last year. So um, they've struggled. That 2010 team you're on about, John, probably you know one of their regrets maybe is what that they didn't, didn't win a couple of more Sam Maguire's at the time because they were very, very good. They had Canty and all these boys. But they've probably suffered a little bit from the hurlers as well in the last couple of years too. Uh, a lot of lads deciding and opting not to play for the footballers and, and put their put their oar in with the with the hurlers. Uh, so look, there's definitely a possibility of them building on there. I think Powder may be a doubt for the final. Uh, he was a great bit of stuff the other day as well. I think he might have done a ham- bit of hamstring or a bit of so- so- some trouble there. So the talent is there, John. It's just getting everybody on the same page and being able to build together. You know. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And it would be interested to see, can Cork give Kerry a good game in the once final one we're really, really looking forward to? And of course, the next game, you had Tipperary against Kerry. Kerry coast known to victory in this game. Kerry 119, Tipperary's 1-8. Tip going out on a bit of a damp squib like Cavan, I suppose, uh, Gary. But uh, Kerry never looked like losing this one. No, uh, again, and, and probably no more than, than Dublin last week in Wexford. They didn't you know, set the world alight, John, but they didn't also never, ever look like losing it. Um, I think from David Clifford's goal onwards, you could tell things weren't just, just wasn't going to happen for Tipperary and you needed them to kind of be within within distance of them coming into half time, and they never really were in touch. So um, based on Tipperary's league campaign, it was never going to be easy to try and rise up for Kerry. But to be fair to them, John, they kind of avoided a, an absolute a hammering. Um, you know, like you could maybe say ourselves got against Mayo. Tipperary set up probably more so not to get hammered, more so than trying to beat Kerry or and, and the more than Limerick with Cork, trying to see maybe come half time, maybe the second water break, were they in with a shout of of maybe putting a bit of pressure on at the end. And again, you know, Kerry are bringing lads off the bench there who who are serious footballers. You know, the bench at the weekend I think was the best they've had maybe in the last two or three years. So that's exactly uh, you know what they want to be, what Peter Keane and them would want to be building towards. And, and Tipperary, obviously, look, it was you know damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know if they went out and had a cut of it, they could have got bet by 25, 30 points. But they decided to hang in there and see could they give it a shot, and they didn't. Um, they're going to need to try and build something again for next year. There might be a few lads there thinking about calling it a day. I know Philip Austin, a few lads left last year after they won the Munster because they probably thought, look. It's not going to get any better than this, but got your man Fox, Brian Fox, wing forward. He's been a serious servant to them. Uh, Quinlevin has struggled with injury and been away the last couple of years. Is he going to hang around? So 
there's a chance to win a Division 4 title next year and build for them. Kerry are obviously looking forward to bigger and better things in the Munster final. So uh, you're right in how you described it. Tipperary went out on, on a bit of a whim. Had they stayed up in Division 3, I think they would have, uh, you know, went out of the championship kind of going, look, we stayed up and that's it. But relegation and, and a meagre defeat to, Ker to Kerry doesn't do much for them this year after the highs of last year. So hopefully they can start again. But there's a couple of teams in a similar boat as you'll go on to as well, John, later down the line. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I suppose I was, I was listening to the Marshall Shea on the Sunday game uh, yesterday and I was just kind of thinking to his comments, Kerry have done everything right so far, they've done everything asked of them so far, they've put in good performances and I suppose, can we kind of jump on this Kerry bandwagon? How good are they looking? Sean O'Shea, David Clifford, the lads kind of shooting lights out the minute. I love David Clifford's goal at the weekend, bullseye bang, no limitations and just left rip and I suppose other, other forwards could probably take notice from that as well, Gary. Yeah, I think so, John. I've seen something different about them this year in the sense that the couple of games I've covered for you and I've been chatting to you on this pod and stuff, I've been watching things a little bit closer. You know, when you think you're going to maybe be talking about it that week, you kind of try and analyse things a little bit more than just kind of sitting there, kind of watching it and passing. But last year, Kerry had a couple of decent wins in the league. They didn't set the world alight, but they never really were getting too excited about things. And that's that understated kind of Kerry approach. And, you know, this Jim Gavin Dublin that, that has brought in that you don't celebrate your goals and things like that. But one thing I noticed this year is any big scores or goals or points that people were getting. Clifford there the other day when he buried the goal had a big fist pump, was going around high-fiving everybody and he was straight on the kick out again. So even when he kicks a bit of worldly, he's putting the hand up, fist pumping lads. And it's kind of showing that they're, they're really, really up for this year. They got absolutely slated last year when... Uh, they got slated last when Cork beat them in that Munster final and they never looked like going. They showed no emotion in the game. So I think that's what they're trying to do. He's done a full 360 now and said, look, lads, go out there and express yourselves. He gives nothing away in his post-game interviews, Peter Keane. You know him. He's one of these uh, one of these cute carry boys. But uh, I think even he himself said the other day he's, he's allowing Paddy Clifford to go out and express himself a little bit more because that's the kind of player he was. Whereas last year, he mightn't have even given him a game, John, because he told us, we, we've no room for lads like him in the team. But what that's allowed is, and you hit the nail on the head mentioning Sean O'Shea. Sean O'Shea has a different role now. He kind of had that Paddy Clifford role where he was dropping out around midfield and around the half-back line and he was spraying ball into Clifford, diagonal ball. Mm -hmm. Now it seems to have changed that Paddy Clifford's out there doing that and it's allowing Sean O'Shea to be closer to goals. The yeah. only thing that that might do is now, that might negate... Paul Ganey was kind of being played as a half-forward and allowed to maybe play that role a little bit, drift in closer to the goals beside Clifford. I'm not sure how that's going to pan out in the next couple of weeks. Gini looks to be playing a little bit better than he did in the league, but um, if Clifford's going to be playing that Roman role, Paulie Clifford, I think they might play Sean O'Shea just on the edge of that D or the diamond to, mm. to play a little bit with, with Clifford. So it's going to be interesting. I mean, it's given them way, way more options than they would have had, let's say, even 12 months ago. Um, and uh, yeah, look, they're, they're looking deadly. I think they are the real deal, to be honest with you, John. I still think they have some issues in defence, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, probably weren't tested properly the other day. Still, Tipperary put up 1-9, I think it was. But uh, they probably, it's hard to know whether they have it in defence. But I like the way they blitz through the league. I like the, that midfielder that's come in there looks a real fine as well. Because more and you'd be worrying as his legs going a little bit. And can he last the pace against a, a Dublin um, or Donegal type team? So I think this Kerry team are the real deal. With what's going on in Dublin at the moment, they're the only they're the only team at the moment I think that can stop Dublin. To be honest with you, um, mm -hmm. and I'd be pinning my hopes on them anyway to do it this year definitely. Yeah, yeah, and they're looking really, really impressive. And I suppose as Tomas was saying, they've, uh, they've uh, completed all tasks so far. It's been put in front of them very impressively, and they are looking very good at the minute. And of course, in the Ulster Championship, first game of the weekend, you had Tyrone one eighteen, Cavan thirteen points, and. Uh, Gary, a good win for Tyrone, Darren McCurry shooting the lights out, but Cavan, uh, what do you really say about them? It's hard to know. Um, you know, you, even when when Mickey Graham was with Mullen and, and the first year with Cavan, um, you know, they allowed him a poor league and relegation because they said, oh, Mickey's a real championship man, you know, and this Cavan team are, are for the championship. They kind of pawned off the same crack again this year, but teams are alive now to Cavan and they know the threats that they bring. Um, team selection, John, I don't know, your, your ear is a bit closer to the ground and I do have my connections in Cavan, but like, seems to never start the 15 that's due to be lined out and you have Connor Martin and these guys who are meant to be, you know, these next best thing and they're never really getting start. And there's a couple of unknowns thrown in there at the weekend as well. And 
in the in the red heated championship against the Tyrone team who have a freshness now with do her over them and Logan. I thought it was strange that he didn't go for a little bit more experience. Uh, Garold McKiernan and Martin Riley will always do the usual jobs, but Dave and Dare, I'd say, are getting a little bit exhausted at this stage because they need someone else to step up. Connor Miner coming back, I thought, might give them a little bit around the middle. But again, John, he's going to be out of practice. Uh, you know, he hasn't played at this level for the guts of two years. So finding it hard to know where they're going and what he's trying to do because I, I just seen. For if you compare it to last year's championship, I don't know whether you'd agree with me or not. I just seen a, lo a, a load of different names there again at the weekend, and I just thought to myself, would he not be trying to keep the bones of that Ulster winning championship team there from last year? So um, I'm sure Mickey, I don't know, he's only had two years there. He's probably going to be given another, another one. Um, they'll get out of Division 4 next year. We know all that, but, you know, the joys of winning the Ulster last year, where do they go from here now? Are they going to return back to the you know, beating the Fermanas and the Antrims and then yeah. get hammers and semi-finals or what's going to happen. So they have a chance to build there now and it just depends what what goes on. It's going to be a long winter for them in that sense and, and uh, I think they need to start building again, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, there's a lot of questions to be asked, I suppose, uh, Tyrone. Uh, Darren McCurry shooting the lights out, uh, sensational performance and I suppose carrying on that rich pain of formally shown in the league campaign as well and it's mad to think he wasn't really in Mickey Hart's plans over the years as well Gary so a, a word on Darren McCurry. Yeah I think he's played he's played his way in there I mean he, he gets these ones one particular score I think was in the Sunday game John he, he, he got it and turned in the corner he caught it in mid-air and came yeah. out and he kicked it from the wrong side in the inside inside of his left of his left foot and curled it up. He do, he's done that five or six times in the league as well. Do you remember he done one from near the end line? And yeah. he's got that bit of flair. The problem, I suppose, with maybe Mickey Hart is he's a real percentage man. Um, you know, maybe McCurry was doing that too much in his time, and he thought to himself, if these aren't going over, I can't risk playing a lad like that. And it's a bit like the Jim Gavin philosophy in Dublin as well. You know, he he knocked the flair out of these Dermot Connolly type players, and Connolly didn't like it. Lads shooting from the corner flag. That's never an option anymore. More at inter-county level. The only likes of, of the Darren McCurries and these boys are the only ones that seem to be able to do it. Andy Moore and Paddy Andrews were two others that could as well. But yeah. if anyone else was taking those shots on John, I think you know they wouldn't be necessarily pleased with him. But McCurry's always had that natural ability. He looks about a stone lighter than last year as well. I'm not sure if you noticed that, but he looks really trimmed up uh, and in good shape. Um, I'm surprised Cavan didn't thought Cavan might maybe drop a, a, a man or two down in front of him. It's easy saying that from the line looking in, but it just looked so easy to get the ball into him. There was yeah. no pressure out the field and there was no pressure in the field, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a class player. If Tyrone have those forwards, if they get Donaghy back and Canavan back and these fellas there, like, they may not be far away either, John, if they're allowed to build. It's just they don't have time to build now. It's straight into the old semi-final. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, look, it's it's no it's no bad thing for Calvin getting beaten by a strong Tyrone team, but it's just the, maybe the nature in which it happened and, and McCurry should have been tightened up on quicker. Yeah, 100%. I suppose Kieran Whelan was kind of referencing the fact that Calvin just looked like the uh, packed up tent and headed home for that second half and maybe large parts of the first half as well, Gary. And I suppose you were referencing Grove McCarran and Martin Riley. You know, Ray Galligan, lads that have been there for a long, long time. Like, are we maybe seeing a few lads maybe stepping away for next year? I know Division 4 is going to be hard. Like, is it time to maybe blood a few new players? Like, I know we've seen Keane Riley, I know we've seen Oshin Pearson, a couple of these lads, but maybe is it a time for a bit of a few lads, a few lads out and a few lads in? Yeah, um, I'm probably similar to what I said on Tipperary. You know, they made Ray Galligan and these boys would probably be looking at saying, look, I've got my Ulster medal. Uh, you know, do we really want to now go down to the doldrums of Division 4? Another way of looking at it is, and maybe where Mickey might try and rally the troops, is by saying, look, boys, we're in Division 4, you got us there. You know, don't be walking away now until you get us out of it. So, and it wouldn't be beyond Calvin to get back-to-back -back promotions up to Division 2, and even at that point, Division 3. So, the thing about Galligan, I suppose, is he might be able to play on a little bit longer. Garold McKiernan, you know, and Martin Riley and the likes of him, I don't think their dedication can be questioned. I think they'll probably hang around. Garoud is considerably younger than the other two, but uh, I think Martin Riley looks as fit as he ever did as well. I don't think he's going away. So I think that I don't see a big raft of retirements, but I do see John him probably using it as a chance to maybe blood a couple a keeper maybe next year in the league, yeah. uh, and also maybe give Garoud and Martin maybe a role off the bench just in Division Four uh, yeah. in order to maybe build around these boys and get them because. 
you know better than, than anyone nearly as well from chatting to a lot of us over the years. Like Division 4, oh yeah, it's the basement. And, but I'll tell you, when you get dragged into some of the dog fights on there, and it's yeah. nice weather in February and March when generally the league is on, it's 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 not as easy as boys think. And most teams with playing against Calvin and Tip next year will be dropping 10, 12, 13 players. Yeah. So yeah. There's... there's you're the, you're you're not the underdog anymore, you know. You're meant to be yeah. the favourite for that for those games. So it'll be interesting to see how those. I think I think the leagues next year, John, are going to be very interesting, provided this affects off and we can we can approach them properly, you know. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I suppose a word, and I, I know you're going to say Mickey Graham, but apparently the word in the street is he had a, a conversation with the players after the game, and he's going to do another year. So I suppose if we if you were Mickey Graham, and I suppose you, you're coming up with different methods, but uh, like, would you walk? Would you stay? Would you go if you're Mickey Graham, or what? Would you, what's the mindset and all that, Gary? I think he's look. People within the county will have their own opinions, as they will in Leitrim about the likes of Terry there. But I think with him winning the Ulster last year, John. He may have earned himself enough, um, you know, enough skin in in the game in order to stay on and be given a chance to get Cavan out of Division Four. I think he'll do that successfully. Uh, I even think he'd probably go on and get them out of Division Three successfully. And given my own experience in Leitrim with chopping and changing managers throughout my career, I just if he has a good cohort of players there at the moment, you'll always hear rumours of a bit of in-house messing and in-house rowing going on. If there's not enough, if there's not too much of that going on, I think it'd be a clever thing for Cavan to give him another rattle at it. If, if for say, they didn't get out of Division 4 next year or they had a poor championship, it's probably time up then. But mm. two, three years, if things aren't happening, he's the Ulster championship to fall back on from last year. Um, and that's not, that was, it was unbelievable stuff, John, you know, in order. Every game as well, they seem to come from behind. So um, I don't know if that luck has run out on them this year because most games when they went behind, I says just wait for Cavan and come now, but they never came. So yeah. maybe that little spark or magic might be gone, but um, I suppose he'll sit down with the players. The players will probably have a chat on their own, John, and say, look, they'll make their feelings known to him. But I'd say, given what he done last year with Cavan, yeah, I have a feeling he'd be staying on for another year, maybe two. And if things aren't happening mid-year next year, it could be the end, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I suppose for the uh, track record Mickey has, even if he does maybe get the road next year, he'll probably have no problem getting another job because he does have a very good track record, uh, track record at the end of the day. So we will wait and see what the next few weeks and months have to bring, Gary. And in the uh, next game in the Ulster Championship Sunday, an absolute cracker. Donegal 16 points, Derry 15 points. And uh, Padre McBride, he'll never have to buy a drink at Donegal again, Gary. No, 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 we were... I was commenting with a mate of mine from Donegal was 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 messaging me during the game just about Leitrim. Of course, my phone was fucking hopping on Sunday, but um, he just said, "Look, uh, Donegal is struggling here, but I, I see them." And I had that feeling myself, John. I don't know about you watching it, but I had me feeling. I just had a feeling the whole time that Donegal were going to win it. Uh, mm. Maybe it was the fact Murphy was coming off the bench. I don't even think it was that because he didn't look 100%. But I just never felt like, you know, an old maid of Mowers that plays in Leitrim as well, Paul, uh, come on and kicked a lovely score from Paul Brennan. And I always yeah. felt they were just keeping themselves in touch, especially when Derry missed that goal. You know, they came off the bar and bounced down on the line when they didn't get that penalty. I just thought any other team would have got those goals and killed off the opposition. Derry just weren't able to do it. And it's probably because they weren't, they were used to being in that position in Division 3, but they were never used to being in that position in the last few years in, in Ulster. So Donegal had the bench to come on and kind of win the game. And I never really felt like they were in trouble. McBrearty, to be fair, and Chrissy McCaig had him in his back pocket the whole day. But that's, that's what quality forwards do. Um, you know, they come up with the clutch moments. They come up with the big plays near the end of the game. And the minute he got the ball, I just had a feeling it was going over the bar. So yeah. it was a great game of football. I really enjoyed it. Fair play to Derry. Gallagher had everything off to a tee. I think just the execution in the end on that goal and maybe not getting the penalty was, was the killer for Derry in the end. Yeah, 100%. It was a terrific, terrific game of football. And I suppose this Derry journey, this Derry team, Rory Gallagher... He's a very, very exciting project in front of him, Gary, if he does stick with it. Yeah, there have loads of footballers, and I think, I seen, I don't, I'm not sure if it was also the final, John, but Derry Miners won last week as well. Uh, maybe it was also semi final. So they've a couple of really strong footballers there as well. Uh, there was a picture of the midfielder going around. He's only 18 years of age, and he's an absolute monster. So, um, Derry always at the footballers, John. I think we, we 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 compare like we're talking about very similar counties here. Cav and I've always said at the footballers, and they done the business last year. It's just about sustaining that consistency. Or Kildare, Derry. There was no question Derry always at the footballers, but they tumbled down to Division Four two or three years ago, and they just had no direction at the top. 
Um, Gallagher would have came down and done a couple of training sessions with us maybe five or six years ago, John, down in Carrick. My God, I've never trained as hard in all my life. And the training was like two hours, 15 minutes long. That was that was all training as well. It wasn't as if he spoke for half an hour at the beginning. And during the drills, he was in your ear just barking at you. You could yeah. hear his breath. And, and that seems to be the intensity that these boys are playing with when you're under them. I can see... If you were, we were shocked because, of course, in, in Leach, we weren't used to this kind of behaviour. But I can see when you're in that bubble with him, how you would absolutely, you know, maybe die for him if you were able to get on with him. And people were questioning him. He, he done a bit of a, He was a bit of a journeyman the last few years, jumping counties here, there, and everywhere. And it didn't seem to work for him. Um, but he's got a tune out. these dairy boys now, and and they're they're a crowd that I they could make a launch at Division One next year. And um, you know, given Donegal are in you know, they're getting a bit on. I know they've lots of young players, Tyrone or Le- Derry could be, you know, you would consider them maybe top three, four teams in Ulster now along with those other three or four. Ulster's just, it's, it's a great, it's a great championship at the moment, John. Yeah, thank yeah. God. Yeah, it's, it's probably the saviour really for all the championships at this yeah. stage and thank God for that Donegal and Derry game. Uh, Donegal, Gary, I suppose where did it go for this uh, Tyrone game? It's going to be a massive test. They looked very ordinary until uh, Murphy came on, and then I know McBurdy kicked the clutch point at the end. But it was, let's be honest, it was probably a bog standard enough performance on Sunday. Yeah, it wasn't. They never again. They never. I never. I never thought they were going to lose it. But I also thought, why are they leaving it so late here? You could you could compare it a little bit to Kerry and Cork in the Munster final last year, John. Kerry never looked like losing it, but they were. They looked like they were in third gear the whole time, and eventually then Cork long ball in goal, and they lost. So. Had one of those goals gone in for Derry, Donegal could be sitting here now in the championship. But uh, I think it was just they wanted to get a good, tough battle. And I don't think a 10-point win would have been any good for the meter going in here against Tyrone. I think they may have got their kick in the kick in the arse at the weekend against Derry. Murphy got more minutes in the legs. I still don't think he'll be 100% for this weekend, but I don't think they can afford to start him on the bench. Because if they give Tyrone the start that they gave Derry... Uh, I think they'll be better out the gate on, on, on Sunday, John. So uh, hugely important they get a better start than they did this week. Um, I think the McHughes, the Hugh McFadden's and these boys might step up a little bit earlier this week. The pressure probably wasn't really on there. Um, I, I suspect Hugh McFadden will probably play as a sweeper in front of McCurry and the boys now this weekend as well. So Tyrone definitely won't get it as easy uh, this weekend and Donegal for certain won't get it as easy this weekend. I think it's the first game where we're actually going this is a tasty, tasty again. Yeah. Everybody in the country is looking forward to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. C- cannot wait for it. And it's it's a real flip of a coin and uh, one we're really, really looking forward to, Gary. And I suppose next in the uh, college championship, Mayo 520, Leach from 11 points. The stage is your, Gary. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't have my Leach from Jersey on this week. I've just I said to you earlier, John, of my blue top on, if it, it matches my mood. Well, uh, I did ask. <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't know where you start here because, um, you know, I done an early from GA podcast last week, and and you don't want to go on there doom and gloom and slating people, and and it's never anything about that. It's it's uh, you know, and as a former player, I don't want to be these lads who shooting off all sorts of headlines. But it was it was it was really bad, John. And and I'll be honest with you, a lot of us were expecting it. Um, the mood, the noise coming out is that things haven't been great there and haven't been great for a long time, if I'm honest. Um, there's no point lads going out in the media the week before championship kind of making things worse. But having seen what we've seen on Sunday, and I for years played for Leitrim John and I got heavy defeats. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I was, a, you know, we were excellent in my time playing. We weren't and we, we did ship some heavy defeats, but I think it was the manner of it on Sunday. Um, I didn't see a hand laid on a Mayo man, and that's not to say that lads maybe weren't trying, but we never got within 10 yards of them. Um, Cohen kicked a point, I remember, in the first half, and uh, I was watching it from the corner, and I think there was three Leitrim men around him, and they were all within 5-10 yards of him, and there wasn't a hand laid on him. Now, whether that was the game plan they were sent out to play, or whether that was just the guys weren't physically able to stay with them, uh, I'm not sure. But we're definitely better than 520 to 11 points. And I understand the argument that's going around now about the tiered championships and this, that and everything else, John. But if you had a fit, if you had a team fit enough and a game plan drilled into a team at the weekend, like, and I'm after criticising them, Limerick against Cork, Tipperary against Kerry. Tipperary only lost by 11 in the end. Now, there's no, there's no joy in an 11-point defeat, but 
Leitrim didn't even seem to set up anyway. They never, they didn't set up attacking. They didn't set up a defending. Um, it just seemed to be that guys weren't clear on what they were meant to be doing. And that's my biggest issue with this is, yes, tier championships, all this sort of stuff. But 12 months ago, Leitrim lost by 11 points, uh, probably against a stronger Mayo team, John. Uh, Killian O'Connor was there. Aidan O'Shea was there going 100%. He didn't look 100% the other day. He didn't look like he cared the other day, really. Um and that was an 11 point defeat now yes it was actually probably worse weather the other day in in, in McHale Park so I understand the, the need for a change in the championship but also there has to be an argument for how well were these lads prepared Um, you know you can whinge and cry about lads leaving the panel the last couple of weeks and struggling for numbers but you must also look at the reasons why they're struggling for numbers why are you struggling for numbers for lads to play for your county and a lot of that is oh they don't want to go out and get hammered against Mayo I don't think a lot of that has got to do with it. Guys want to wear the Leitrim jerseys. There's there's loads of good footballers in Leitrim. Are we light years behind, John? 100%. I've been saying that, and I'll be honest with you, I've been saying that since the mid-2010s, back to 2014, 2015, when we were getting beaten by a, a Galway team in transition. Now, it wasn't even, it was when Comer and Shane Walsh and these boys made their debuts. We were bet by a Galway team by six or seven points in Carrick. And even that day, I came out and said, look, they're in transition. They're nowhere near their best. And they still bet us by six or seven points this evening. And we put in the best performance we put in in the championship in years. So I'm not stupid. We were light years behind when I started, John, back in 2006, 2007. But we were able to compete. It's only the five, ten years down the line that you'll really be found out. Um, I still think we should have been better prepared than we were on Sunday. I still think we don't have the best Leitrim squad out in the field for us. Um, and, you know, I still feel at county board level and at underage level, things are not right either. Um, you know, I, I, I go back to my time playing um, under 16s for Leitrim, John, and we played Cavan in a, in a Dolan Cup game, you know, as it, as it was, is that the Dolan Cup or the Hastings Cup, maybe? The Hastings Cup. Yeah. The Hastings Cup, yeah. And, and we would have quite a decent team, but I remember the Cavan boys showing up that time and it was the same age as... Uh, Key and Mackey's year. Right, so yeah. Would have been a talented Cavan team, better out the gate. But I just watched them coming in the gate that day, head to toe in Cavan gear. Um, during the game, they were head to toe in, in all the right gear, the socks, the shorts, everything. That was the time Cavan and Roscommon and these counties says, right, lads, here we go. And that was the f- six, seven years later that just won those four in a row under, under <laughs> once. I remember thinking to myself that day, we, had any, we were all out on the pitch, John, different shorts and socks, club colours. Uh, and, you know, the sad fact is, uh, and this isn't a criticism of anyone directly, but the same still happening now in Leitrim at under 16 level, under 15 level, under 14 level. There's great coaches there. They're giving up their time voluntary. I'm not having a pop at anybody, but they're on about this 10 year, year plan. I see Terry the other day on about a 10 year plan. You know, who's going to oversee this 10 year plan and who's going to actually get a task force together to implement it? I think if there is a task force put together, John, it needs to be of people who aren't currently involved. Now, who's going to give up their time? I don't know whether it's former county players. And that can be ladies and men, John. I'm not saying this is specific to anybody, but a group of people or a cohort of people needs to be set up in order to look at that and try and put something in place. Because it's not just at any particular club level, county board level, underage level, the senior team at the moment. It's everywhere. It is absolutely everywhere at the minute where Leitrim needs to sit down and have a look at it. I don't know all the answers. I'm not too pushed. I, I do think something needs to happen in the championship, as much as I sound like I'm not saying it's a big thing. It is a big thing. Obviously, we want to compete where we're able to compete. Um, you know, every I see, you know, when Paddy Andrews and Andy Moore on their podcast, they're kind of saying that, oh, look at Offaly and look at Antrim. Them boys are able to kind of prepare. We done that two years ago, John. We bet all rings around us in Division 4 in the league um, and got to a league final against Derry. Derry were the only team that beat us. So... For these teams to say, why aren't Leitrim, are Leitrim preparing as well? We prepared well enough two years ago. Why are we not preparing well enough now? And we were never going to beat Mayo the other day. I think everybody could hold their hands up and say that, but we definitely could have competed better. So there's issues, there's questions to be asked to Terry and the lads. There's questions to be asked to the county board. There's questions to be asked at, asked at underage level. There's questions to be asked everywhere. And it's no one person's fault. Um, I understand all that. But we've been dancing around this subject in Leitrim for 10, 15 years now. And I don't know what we're going to do. They'll start throwing resources and money. But, you know, we've run some really successful fundraisers the last few years. Where is where is that going? Is that going to the run of the senior team mileage? I don't know. But 
we're better than we showed on Sunday. That's all I'm saying. Um, we're a lot better uh, than we showed on Sunday. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And uh, I suppose, Gary, when you're hearing the likes of maybe 15 lads, uh, I, I, did you hear that, uh, to turn up the training sessions in, in, in late term and I suppose not competing at that level? And I, I know there's talk about tier competitions and I'm a strong adv- advocate for this, maybe bring in like a junior, intermediate and senior championship. And wouldn't Leitrim be better off playing the likes of Carlo, Waterford, something to aim towards, Gary, because at the end of the day, when the Leitrim lads know they're coming up against Mayo in the championship, that's the season over. So it's just, it's 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 flawed in every sense of the word, I suppose, Gary. Yeah, it's flawed everywhere, John. And the issue I have with that, as you say, I, I like the idea of a tier competition, surely, but it'll get no it'll get no attention. Um, and I'm not saying lads want to play for their counties to get attention, but I mean the media scrutiny of the last four or five years, even since I finished playing, you've Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. These younger guys are getting looked after a little bit better because they're able to maybe make a better life for themselves more so than 10 years ago when we, we'd go to games and you'd be struggling to find a match report on the game the following day. The way I would compare it, John, is any of the draws we got against the Wicklow's, Carlos, or any of them the last couple of years in qualifiers and things, you'd barely have a reporter at those games. And that's the truth. So the tiered competition is a nice idea, but I, I don't I don't, I don't, don't agree with it for one reason, is that the GA might commit to, oh yeah, we'll do up a nice shiny cup for you and oh, you'll play, you'll play before the All-Ireland semi-final or Oh yeah, we'll do all that. They won't do all that. I mean, it's it's easy for them to say that uh, when I know I've played qualifier games over the years which were humdingers matches and you'd look around, there wouldn't even have been a report on the Sunday game on the Sunday night and um, there wouldn't even have been a barely a report in the newspaper the next day. So that's my only problem with the whole tier thing is the younger guys who are putting in the level who will want to play for their counties won't be getting any exposure um, and I think it's unfair on that because you have to think about it. It's not about the exposure, John, but it's also about being looked after well. And I just don't think that that will come uh, uh, with a, with a tur- with a three tier thing. I do think something needs to be done. And listening to all the kind of scrutiny Leitrim have been getting over the last few days, I I don't know how to fix it. To be honest with you, I know how to fix it internally, and I know what you'd need to do to fix it. But I don't even know how you go about it because you need serious buy in from everybody. Um, you need serious buy-in from, I think maybe the, the two-tier thing will work. I think three tiers all of a sudden you're getting a little bit diluted. The junior thing won't get any attention. I think maybe a, a two teams of 16 might get a little bit more more attention. And if you do it on the places in the National League, it might actually add a little bit more zest into that as well. Not that you need to. The National League is actually the best competition we have, you know. Mm. So a uh, bit of a rant there, John. I think you had a feeling that was coming up, mate, but... Uh, there's no one person to blame, but uh, uh, all that I'm after going through, it's at every level, senior, underage, county board, the management team. It's just, there's been a bad vibe in that in that, in that that squad for a long time now, um, and something needs to be done about it. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose, so was lastly thing on us, I suppose a word on maybe the management team, Terry Highland, and I know he's, he's a good backroom team, but I, I, I think I overheard maybe some of the backroom team members saying, like, I'll, like Terry rang me and like, I'll do another year if he does another year. So uh, hearing that sort of vibes coming from Leitrim thing, I know maybe money can have a big say in it, Gary, but if you want to progress as a county, put an imprint in the county, you need to be taking it more seriously. Yeah, I think so. And uh you know, I was texting a few people, as I said, and, and, and people would say, if Terry goes, who do you get? And, and that's a good question. I mean, who who do you get at this point? You know, we've, we've gone down loads of different roads. Um, I've been involved with loads of managers, John. I was involved with certain managers who looked ahead, who wanted to plan for the future, asked the county board for three to five years to sort it out. And the rug was pulled under them after two years when they were doing great work, just because results weren't going their way. But results are the exact same as they were five years later. So... Unless somebody has a bit of foresight to allow a manager time to do a root and branch clear out, um, you know, if that means, you know, getting rid of certain lads and like like older lads, you know, even like what happened to us. But, you know, Terry had got together quite a good squad in, in, in we talked about Derry there, we're raving about Derry, John, two years ago we very well should have beaten Derry in Crow Park in the final. Derry with the same squad of players has gone on. And our squad has been ravaged. I'd say if you went through the 26 that were on the squad that day, how many of them were in the squad against Mayo the other day? Dublin, Kerry, handful of teams can maybe get away with that. We can't get away with that. Um, you know, as I said, they're going on about lads not showing up to training. Why are they not showing up to training? 
you know, it's nothing to do with worrying about getting a hammer off Mayo. If thing, if lads were enjoying it and things were being done correctly, they'd be showing up for training. So, I don't know. Um, I don't think Terry would want to flog a dead horse either. If 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 the support is there, you know, maybe the players need to step up and have their own chat and, and see if they want to change. Personally, at this stage, and the more than when I went back to Mickey Graham, I think if things aren't happening after three years in the job. Uh, John, which they aren't at the moment, unfortunately, I think it's probably time, I would be thinking uh, it would be time to leave, unless he totally freshened up his backroom team as well, along with it. So, um, from the outside looking in, and again, it's not me calling for anybody's head or anything like that, but um, I'd probably be thinking it might be time for, for a fresh for a fresh, a fresh approach. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I suppose, Gary, even after the game, so Terry did kind of reference the fact that maybe there's not been enough done at underage level, maybe at various teams and kind of the championship's a bit flawed and everything. But at the end of the day, Gary, you really have to work with the lads you got. Exactly. And I mean, you know, two years ago when we won five games in a row in the league, uh, you know, the club system wasn't called into question then. Um, the underage system wasn't called into question then. Um, you know, we've lost games against the same opposition in the National League this year. Um, you know, Loud, Antrim and Sligo teams we were walking through two years ago. So, I mean, you know, you can't forget what happened last year or the year before. Um, these things these things changed for a reason. Something has happened. Why did we have such a strong year in, in, in 2019 and now, two years later, uh, we've totally changed personnel and uh, teams we were hammering two years ago are beating, doing well and competing with are, are walking through us on, you know, are you telling me that Sligo seven points a better team than Leitrim? No way they're not. Um, and I know we had a red card in that and there's circumstances you have to look at. But yeah, you have to work with the players you have, John, but it's the players you have and the players you haven't. Like, I know, um, you know, we've mentioned it a few times yourself about Emla Mulligan and that, and I agree with you. It's not because of mates with him, I would say it, but you look at the other clubs who you, everyone's ranting and raving about. Antrim there, Michael McCann playing this year, and Paddy Cunningham came on and kicked the equaliser and the winner in two games. Um, Niall McNamee for Offaly, massive player for them and getting them promoted to Division 2. Um, you know, we can't afford to have the likes of, of Emla sitting along the line watching in. He's a man you could bring in if you sat him down, I'm sure, and had a conversation with him and said, look, you're not going to be a 70-minute player anymore. Um, you know, and not just using Emlyn as, as, as... There's loads of examples in the county there at the minute, John, that you could put the same thing to. And not just our lads. There's younger lads there that aren't playing for a particular reason. But you need to sit down with these guys and have a conversation with them and get the buy-in from everybody. He kind of done that at the beginning, and it worked. We had a really good squad that day in Derry. But... You know, I think by the end of the year, it was maybe 10 or 12 lads gone of that squad. So that's nearly half of them over in 12 months. So uh, you do you have to work with the lads you have. Um, you could have more at your disposal, but for, for whatever particular reason, you don't want that. And that again, that's not me calling for any particular, you know, for myself or anything. Absolutely not. But there's lots of lads there who could offer something. And there's lots of good footballers in Leach and John as well. Uh, I just want to get that point across too. There is lots of good footballers in Leach. Yeah, I suppose lastly on it, Gary, probably what mystifies me is, and I, I was saying this in the GA Fan TV podcast, that if you can leave the likes of yourself, Emma Mulligan, and a couple of other players out, and like maybe, I don't know, the Terry not like attitudes or like the way maybe certain players are going on, but my opinion on it, and this is an outside look in, you need yourself, you need yourself, you need yourself and Emma playing football. And just forget attitude aside. And as you said, maybe have a conversation. You might be a 15, 20 minute man. Leave your football, leave yourself Emily the Mulligan. And that'll be my take on it. Yeah, yeah, no, and I appreciate that, John. I don't know at this stage now whether I'd be any any use to anyone, but uh, uh, I'm actually playing in the forwards now for the club, so maybe down to the square or something. But uh, no, uh, I look, yeah, no, and, and there was no, there was no big fallout, John. Like you know, there was there was no big fallout at the end of the day. I can't really point any figures or criticize. I felt I was a bit underused that first year. Uh, I'm not stupid. I understand. I'm not a seventy minute man. There's no way I could. But a division four, division three. I definitely felt I could still compete. Um, I know I'm not going to be used in every game because I'm not kind of a match winner. I might be a lad that come in and settle things down. And that's where my frustrations were that year. Uh, 
And, you know, I think Eminence maybe were the same, but I understood from early on that I was no longer going to be a starter and I was happy to help the squad in the background and, you know, I chatted to the lads an awful lot and half-time of games, I took some of the t- some of the half-time chats with the boys just to get things settled in and that was, I was quite happy playing that role. Uh, you know, I did feel as it went on and, and certain games, like we were bullied against Roscommon and teams like that, I did feel I deserved to be maybe used at that point and it was quite clear at that stage that I wasn't going to be. So I was kind of left with no other no other alternative but to probably walk away at that point and that was my kind of thing and and um, maybe Emlyn felt the same so in fairness to Terry like he, he didn't necessarily drop me I maybe kind of voluntarily kind of said look if you're not going to use me um, I'm as well head off and enjoy my club football and, and that's kind of what happened since then but um, yeah I, I think you need but any successful county or club John that you've ever been involved in had the buy-in from seniors middle middle age guys mid 20s and the young guys and um i think you can see that in Offaly. you can see it in antrim and they've had john mohan and 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 the guy up the north mcginley has come in and completely freshened things up and accepted everybody back in and in fairness terry did that at the beginning but i think he could have kept certain lads sweet when he didn't and and um i don't know i i can't comment about a lot of it john because i haven't been involved in a long time so i'm not going to to play here say but something's not right somewhere and uh I think when we all buy in, we've actually, which we did in 2019 and in years before that, you know, when we all bought in, it was actually, there's lots of good footballers there in Leitrim and there's lots of good lads with good attitudes. And that's not to say the boys at the weekend were there, that there's plenty of good footballers played there on Sunday, John, but they didn't look prepped to have any sort of impact on the game. And that's probably what ended up happening in the end, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, poor, uh, I think Terry has a lot to answer for and I suppose he can, uh, uh, maybe he cut a lot of lads in calf and there's probably still a, har- a lot of harsh feelings about that over the years too so a uh, lot of work to be done in Leitrim and uh, we will just wait and see what the next few weeks and months have to bring for themselves so uh, moving on to uh, this weekend you have uh, Ulster Championship action you have Ar- Armagh against Monaghan and Leicester Championship action Kildare against Osmead and Dublin versus Mead first game of the weekend you have Armagh against Monaghan a cracking game in store there Gary yeah the two Ulster semi-finals John are, are two real you come to a point where you're like these are going to be these are going to be proper battles um you know people have argued that Monaghan maybe aging a little bit Banty's kind of not really showing any direction they kind of yo-yoed a bit in the league where they won a game and lost the next one and showed some battle in that last game against Galway um Armagh finally made the step up to division one it was crucial that they stayed up there and they did in the end so both teams coming in on a real high um, is McManus fit? I don't know. They're saying there's still a little bit of a doubt over him. I think if he's not there, Jack McCarran has stepped up very well. Um, Conor McCarthy hasn't really been seen. I don't think John since he got his hat trick that day um, a couple of weeks ago in the league. So um, it's a hard one to call. I've always had a bit of a sh- a bit of a soft spot for this Armagh team for some reason. I just think some of the scores, Grugan and these boys, the O'Neill brothers, like there's some serious footballers there. Big, rangy, physical guys that can kind of go through anyone. So um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, these two games are the two also semi-finals are very very hard to call. Um, I just think based on. Um, you know what's coming. I know Armagh. You know people have argued that Armagh were very poor against Antrim, but again, it comes to a scenario where you have nothing to lose. Nearly the the the, the underdog Antrim have nothing to lose, um, and they come in off a positive league. So I just have a feeling Armagh might do enough here. Um, I wouldn't discount it going to extra time. Um, I just think Armagh have. A little bit of freshness about them, whereas Monaghan are still relying on some of the older heads, the Darren Hughes, the Conor McManuses, and these guys. And you'd wonder what sort of shape they're in for 70 minutes of a of a red heat battle in an Ulster Championship. So I'm going to give Armad a nod here tentatively. Maybe it'll only be two or three points in it in the end. Yeah, an absolutely intriguing game. I suppose touching on that as well, Conor McManus, we don't know if he's fit or not, Gary. So surely that's worth four or five points to Armad, really at least and it's worked also their game plan completely changing as well um like you still have to put your best man marker on maybe mccarran or mccarty or whoever else is going to play there and that's not look monon have brought on some lovely young footballers as well but i just don't think they'll have seen a battle like this before they're probably you know i'm probably contradicting myself here a little bit john and saying that monon probably have more experience in that team than armagh at this level but i just think there's a freshness about armagh that we haven't seen for a while 
Uh, McGeaney has them playing good football. He was called into question a year or two. Where was he going with this team when they didn't get promoted again out of Division 2? But I think he's shown the last year or two that these boys really want to play for him. So uh, if McManus doesn't make it, I, I, I definitely give our mad a nod. But even if he makes it, I still think there's something about them, John, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I suppose last thing on it, big pressure on Kieran McGeaney because obviously, as you were saying, pressure on last year. I know he's brought in Kieran Stardoni. So if it's not this game, when will it be, uh, Gary? Yeah, um, exactly. Um, he, he's a big background team there. I know Kieran McKeever is with them as well. Um, and it's very experienced, as you said. And Armagh are quite obviously putting an awful lot of money into this setup. Uh, physically, you can see John as well. They're huge men. They've put on a lot of bulk in the last two years, especially since they've come up to Division 1. I think what's helped a lot of teams, John, and I noticed that with the Mayo team the other day, I think COVID has helped an awful lot of team to kind of look at their S&C again. It's given them more time in the gym. Um, I know last year when Mayo played Leitrim in, in October, November in the championship, I couldn't get over the size that Killian O'Connor and, and probably Aidan O'Shea probably lost a bit. There were certain lads that needed to bulk up and other lads that probably needed to knock off a little bit. So these are my boys have put on serious gains in the last year or two, but it's it's not like it was back in, in my day, John, where you put on as much as you could. It's it's all designed to what you need to build your speed up and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think they, a lot of money being pumped in in Armagh, and I think if they can get through Sunday, which uh, or Saturday maybe it is, they'll fancy themselves maybe in a one-off Ulster Championship game. Look what Cavan done last year, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I know for COVID it didn't treat me too well, so I don't know about yourself, guys, as well. So <laughs> no, no, it didn't treat me well either, unfortunately. But uh, but uh, uh, when you get these warnings that things are opening up again, it, it gives you a bit of it gives you puts the pressure on a little bit. Oh, jeez, when I'm eating a packet of crisps or, or self, uh, lets me know about it. So I don't know what uh, your situation is, Kaz. I get I get a lot of stick about it myself now. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> we must get on to get we must get on to geezer, Kaz. I think I think we're in the wrong uh, setup. Like <laughs> for a few sessions. <laughs> and then the next game you have Tyrone against Donegal, Kaz. How are you supposed to call that? That's just an absolutely intriguing game, and uh, especially after last weekend, Donegal will have a big point to prove. Yeah, they do. There's still questions being asked. Uh, I believe, I didn't see the Nordic, the BBC NI coverage, John. I don't know if you've seen it, but I believe Martin McHugh was having lots of digs at uh, at um, the Donegal manager, Bonner. So there must be something going on there. There's no, and, and I know Mickey Hart claimed he was only saying that because they were playing their own next weekend, but there must be something there. Um, I think Donegal are getting, the more than one, and they're getting to a point where they're like, if we don't do something in the next two or three years, um, with Mick, with Murphy and, and, and these boys. I know McFadden's a little bit younger, but there's a couple of lads there, McHugh, and they're probably saying, with this group of players, we need to probably be making a challenge at, at Dublin in the next year or two, or it's probably going to, they're going to have to rebuild again. And Bonner's aware of that, and they've Rochford in there as well. They've quite a good backroom team. So um, it's funny, I'm going for the two teams that I think are a little bit more fresher than the other and aren't as reliant on some of their big game players. Like, um, you know, everybody's reliant on their big game players, John. But I just think, I have a feeling about our man, Tyrone. I think Tyrone, again, are, are building nicely. They had a couple of indifferent league performances under the new management. But I like I liked the look of them at the weekend. McNamee, stupid what he done. I know they're saying it should be rescinded and it probably should, but he knows rightly now everybody's watching him. Why would he do something so stupid? So I think it's reliant on whether he gets that rescinded, John. I think it's reliant on Murphy, whether he's able to start and, and play the whole game. I just he changed the game last week. Now he might have been involved in every score, but they outscored Derry, I think, eight to four when he was on the field. So that tells its own story just about the it, it takes two or three other players to mind him when he comes on, whereas before that, they didn't really have too many players to mind Bar McBrearty. So um, I'm going to go to Rome in this one again, and purely based on fresher approach, they're not as reliant on two or three players as Donegal are um, in Murphy, and I just don't think Murphy's 100% and probably won't be for the weekend. So um, tentatively again to Tyrone, um, so I'm going to Tyrone or Miles to Ulster final. I could be completely wrong, John, but I just get that feeling about the two teams are coming strong this year. Yeah, definitely. I suppose can I, the first thing on, I suppose Donegal having the game against Derry, Tyrone having the game against us. I suppose Donegal's preparation going into this game seems to be that bit better because, you know, we didn't put up a challenge against Tyrone. They're probably not be using that game as great preparation, but Donegal got a hell of a test against Derry and uh, Declan Bonner would definitely be happy with it. He will, he will. You know, he'd be secretly happy that they got that. As I said, no more than Cork and Limerick, 
um, you know, and teams like that, they got the kick in the arse. Maybe they needed prior to this weekend because, as as if you, as I said earlier, if you let Tyrone start the way Derry started, they'd be out of sight after 15, 20 minutes. Donegal don't want that to happen again. And you'll have Neil McGee and Ryan McHugh and these boys. And maybe I'm discounting them a little bit too much. It's probably not fair. Them boys have serious experience. So I may be discounting Donegal a little bit too much, but I just feel... Um, they looked a little bit leggy in the first 20 minutes the last day and maybe that's the approach that Bonner took but um, yeah I mean I think with Donegal if they're going to challenge this Dublin team before kind of Kerry have come in the last two years Donegal were always billed as this the next team that could maybe challenge Dublin and they haven't um, you know they, they fell at the final hurdle in the Ulster final last year took their eye off the ball and I'm just wondering now with, with Murphy's injury and a few other lads not firing you know, will Tyrone watch the way Derry approached it at the weekend and, and have, you know, someone tight on, on McBriarty and maybe a sweeper in front of him? So it's an interesting one. It's intriguing, John, and there's no right or wrong. There's no right or wrong call here because there's nothing between the four teams. But I, I just feel, you know, I, 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 I prefer to see Donegal win it because I'd love to see them get another Ulster title and see what they could do in the, in the semi final. But I just feel Tyrone have, have a little bit more zip about them this year than they've had in a long time. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. They call McShane back fit. Darren it's Curry kicked other big yeah. reason. And McKenna, yeah. McKenna wasn't even didn't even play the other day. I don't exactly, think. exactly. Yeah, no, he didn't. He didn't. And Darren McCurry, I know we were loose against it, but you know, to ten score what ten points in the championship game, uh, Gary, that's seriously impressive. So going Great. into that game, and I suppose lastly on it, like with with uh, Darren McCurry, like he'll hardly get that space against Donegal the weekend, Gary. No, I don't think so. Um, you know, Neil McGee is back there, and. Um, he just he doesn't look the player he was. Um, I don't think they'll have the likes of Neil on him, but they might have a sweeper or something worked out. Home ball Gallagher has been kind of playing further out the field, but I'd have a feeling he could be in there at the weekend as well. But you might remember um, you might remember all the goals they conceded a, a couple of months ago in the National League that evening. Uh, I don't see the same thing happening, but Tyrone might try and target that, you know. Um, but yeah. There's 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 a job to do there now. Paddy McGrath is probably you know no more than Neil McGee. Maybe not the best men to be putting on anymore on the, on the man marking duty because if McCurry gets that space as you says he kick points all day and he's when his tail is up he's a real confidence player John. When his tail is up he's dangerous. He's as dangerous as there is in the country and his tail is up at the minute. So if they can stop McCurry, I still think there's as you says McShane got minutes at the weekend. Um, you know you've Donaghy who was quiet. Um, you've got a few other lads to come in. I don't know if Canavan is back, but like if the, Tyrone get this team going and get this forward unit moving the way they should, they could be dangerous and, and Donegal could struggle to contain them, but it's going to be a great battle either way. Yeah, yeah, and really, really looking forward to it. I'll tell you what, Gary, thank God we have these games because they really are saving this uh, championship that's getting a lot of criticism at the minute, Gary, especially after that Mayo and Leitrim game. And in the Leicester championship, you have Kildare against Westmead and Dublin against Mead. So Kildare, Westmead, Gary... You'd be a brave man to call that one. Yeah. Um, again, we I all we always have a lightning for the Kildares and the Corks and these teams because we know how good they are on their day. It's just consistency is probably an issue. Um, you know, Westmead are gritty. And um, that's an experienced team there at the moment with Egan and 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 um, our mate Heslin inside and all these boys. It's not a bad Westmead team and Caroon around the middle. They've been building that team for a while. Your man seems to have a good head in his shoulders as well, the manager. So um, it's a tough one to call. Uh, uh, you know, you'd have them on a par at the moment with where they are in the league and how they've played this year. But I just think Kildare, um, if they can loosen the shackles and O'Shea lets them play, I think they could win this one. Um, again, you know, bar maybe the next one we're going to talk about, there's nothing in any of these games you've mentioned, John. So I just give Kildare maybe a tentative nod because I think the weather's meant to be good this weekend. And I just, Kildare are one of those really slick footballing teams you associate with good summer football, good weather, Galway, Cork, Kildare. You know, those real footballing teams kick pass and have some really talented forwards. I know Daniel Flynn was on the bench. He'll probably be on the bench again this weekend and they'll use him sparingly. But if he can have an impact off the bench, I think Kildare will have too much for them, yeah. Yeah, and like another really, really good game to look forward to this again for cracking games. But I suppose Dublin against Mead, I suppose they're just holding out hope here. Maybe I know um, Eric Lowndes has recently stepped away. I think he stepped away yesterday from the Dublin panel. Stephen Cluxon still hasn't said his intention. So is this finally, finally, finally a good chance for Mead against Dublin, Gary? You'd wonder when's a good chance or not. But um, yeah, I suppose when you look at it, Andy McEntee's probably under... 
wouldn't say he's under pressure, but I mean, he's, he's built a really good mead side there. Uh, they are actually not a bad side as well, John. And, and the problem with all these good teams in Leinster, we seem to forget that they're actually all very good footballing teams because we're comparing them against Dublin, um, uh, which is a little bit unfair because Dublin are so much better than everybody. But Mead have, have built a really good squad there, loads of really good footballers. Um, Lowndes leaving is, is a blow as well because they're not, you know, all of a sudden now Dublin are kind of wondering, we're not as blessed as backs with, for backs as we used to be. I'm not sure the reasons why, John. I can only maybe pick out that he hadn't been getting a sniff because I think his last game to either start or come on was last year's Leinster final. Um, and when you consider maybe there's been four or five league games since that and he hasn't he hasn't featured or is there I think, he, I think he played against Dunny I think he played a couple of the league games. I think he came on with you. This year, I think, yeah, yeah. He, can, he was playing against right. Goal, I think, yeah. Right, OK, yeah. well, I'm wrong there. So, but I'm not sure why he's walking away then. Um, was it commitments or what, whatever it might have been? The thing with Cluxton, as much as I wouldn't have thought it was a major issue at the beginning, John, has, has actually come across as being a major issue now. Um, again, you know, more than talking about England and all these other things, it seems to be the press and media that thrives a lot of this stuff. And, and Cluxton maybe wanted a little bit more time or maybe he's just decided to step away and he wouldn't be one for these big uh, statements and threats and things like that. So, look, I still I still think Dublin have so much experience in the in the Fentons and Kilkenny's, and them boys will be able to steer the ship, even if they have a couple of scary moments at the weekend. Um, if me me are probably in their training this week, saying lads, we never get a better chance to play these fellas. They're on the rocks a little bit, but. Um, you know, they beat Wexford in third gear a couple of weeks ago and I fancied them to win this one again. John, I'd love to be a romantic and say, geez, me could run them close, but I don't I don't see it happening, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I suppose, Gary, it's, it's, it's in Croke Park. It's not Nav and it's not, it's, it's not uh, really an away venue for Dublin, so I suppose that probably would give them a chance. But I suppose if Mead are to maybe look at a few areas, maybe some of their forwards, maybe the young forwards that Mead have, is there any way they can exploit this Dublin defence? I think so. We've been talking for a few years about the Dublin full back line maybe not being as strong as it was and Cooper and these boys getting on a little bit. Um, I still think there's a bit of a kink there at the moment, um, especially now Keanu Sullivan is gone, John. I don't think people realise the job he done there kind of sweeping up in front of them. John Small, I don't think is going to be back yet either. I think his hamstring's pretty bad tear. So all of a sudden you'll be looking and the mean forwards will be looking there and going, you know, Philly McMahon's not getting any younger. Um, obviously you've got Merchant and you've got some serious, serious footballers there. No denying it, but yeah, Merchant's. I, I think he's not fit, or apparently but, he's only. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. He's only back from injury. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, yeah, you 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 you've, you've hit the nail on the head there, John. There's the mean forwards and Andy McIntyre could be sitting there this week thinking, Jesus lads, and Comerford and goals relatively inexperienced at this level, so. You know, maybe it is the best time that could be meeting them. Um, you know, you've got Fenton and the guys and up front, up front and, and midfield, there's no issue there at all. But maybe at the back, there's a few questions to be asked. And Mickey Newman's back this year as well for Mead. Yeah. He, Mickey, no more, you know, Mickey's getting on in his 30s, but he's a serious man to kick a point when he gets space. So if they can get the likes of him space um, and a couple of you, Killian O'Sullivan and these boys, they're well able to play football. Um, it's just the confidence and if they can hold... You know, they, don't, they held Dublin to a couple of scores. Remember, is it two years ago? And then Dublin just in 15 minutes absolutely blitzed them. So yeah, yeah. it's hard to know what way to approach it. I would try and hold tight till half time, And if they're still in the game, maybe let the shackles off a little bit for the third quarter. But that's usually when Dublin put the press on. So yeah, yeah. a lot a will matter on kickouts for both sides. Are Mead going to press the Dublin kickout? And are Dublin going to press? Dublin will press the Mead, the Mead kickout. We know that. Um, yeah. And it's probably an area Mead have struggled a little bit over the last couple of years is their goalkeeper. They've had a couple of different keepers and they don't they don't seem to have an answer there yet either. Yeah, 100%. I suppose, last thing on it, Gary, I suppose, away from the game for a second. Uh, we see Paddy Andrews and Andy Bourne doing a serious job and off the ball at the minute of the podcast. And I'm just interested to hear your perspective on it. I know you've seen a lot of Dublin club football, but Paddy kind of talking about like playing for Dublin and it just seems so intense and you constantly need to be on it. And it just, I know all the success, but it just didn't seem overly enjoyable. We see the likes of Eric Lyon stepping away, Keanu Sullivan, Conley, all the boys gone, Paddy, you know, Paddy Andrews in the last while. So, guys, does the fun seem to be stopping in Dublin football? Yeah, I think it's such an intense bubble to be involved in, John. I'd say, you know, even playing for Leitrim for that period of time, it, you found it very hard in your spare time to know what to do with yourself. And even if you did want to go in and let the hair down, you found that you 
couldn't really do it openly around your own hometown or not your hometown, but in around. So I can imagine them Dublin boys, the pressure they may be under, um, you know, to perform to certain levels, to always have themselves turned out well, to always be able to step up to the to the plate. And it's probably, you know, as much as, you know, we've been whinging over the years at times and Leitrim saying we don't get the same attention, you know, we have to travel two hours every night for training and then boys walk down the road to a centre of excellence, which is, you know, like a professional footballer's kind of thing. So I'd say it's got to a stage where Jack McCaffrey and, and Paul Mannion were kind of the first two to kind of say, look, we just want to step away for a while and have a life for ourselves. And mm-hmm. I actually think throughout the country, John, it's happening an awful lot more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I was young, and I empathise a little bit with the younger guys, and I think I mentioned it on a previous pod with you, even playing a bit of club football there. Growing up, expecting to be Monday to Sunday, 24-7, Football, 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 do your gym, do your runs, do your yeah. fo- do your football work, your skills work. You know, don't have a pint on a Friday because you've, you know, you have a big game on the Sunday. Sunday, Saturday night, you can't go out because you have a big training or a match. And it's just a continuous cycle where you're expected. So I can see now there's far more options and there's far more out there now than there was when we were growing up. Now, I know I'm making it sound like me and you are ancient, but I'm even only talking five, ten years ago, John. It's totally changed. And... I look at my own nephew there who plays for my club and I just see that his group of friends and they're a lot more outgoing and, you know, maybe it's got to a point now, even in the rural towns in Ireland, and it's just maybe football isn't the most important thing in a lot of young lads' lives. So I always say with young lads and don't give them too hard time because I would have been an awful man for barking and giving out. And, you know, if a lad, if a lad like me is barking or giving out to you every night you come out training or to play a match, where is the enjoyment in that, you know? Um, you have to, lads are going to make mistakes, we all are. And maybe that's the way the Dublin lads are gone uh, in a sense that it's so intense in there. You know, yeah. it's all about reading your body language. I'm sure Jim Gavin was an awful man for reading your body language. If you ever said, oh, for feck's sake, or you threw your hat at something all of a sudden you might be sitting on the bench for two or three weeks and you have to have this persona on you. So um, I would say it's just got a bit intense for them, John, a lot of them, and they want to have a bit of crack outside of it and and be able to have a pint whenever they felt the need to and enjoy their studies or work or whatever it was, you know. And I think that's throughout the country that's happening at the moment. Yeah, see, it does seem to be nationwide. I suppose I was watching an interview and I think I've I've always referenced this, uh, Jack McCarthy off the ball last week or a couple of years ago there and he he was talking to Jerry Gilroy and he was just saying, like, if I'm playing for Dublin in five years, you have the permission to shoot me. Okay, he was joking, but it just does go to show you can win this, you can win that, but it does seem to be a bit of a problem within uh, the football at the minute, Gary. Yeah, and, and, you know, Terry did say something the other day, in fairness, after our own game where younger lads now are beginning to realise, and if Terry, a man who's in football an awful long time and the experience he has is noticing it, um, you know, it, it is an issue. We've had a couple of really good footballers probably not commit to this to our club team over the last few years because if it's not bred into you at home like it probably was me and you, John, and other people who grew up on the GAA, you can see why when they go home and it's not in their forefront and it's not in their mind all the time and their parents <laughs> are asking them about this lad and that lad and how to train and go if it's not that way inclined you can see how people kind of go well this isn't it like this you know this whole thing of our oh, football is your life and yes it is for a lot of us but um it's just harder john i think it's getting to a stage where they're looking so hold on a minute you train for nine months of the year and you only play 10, 12 games of competitive football and you do 70, 80 training sessions between them and they go, yeah. Like, I do talk to lads who play soccer and things like that and they train for three or four months of the year and play maybe 15, 20 games and they're like, you're madness. It's absolutely mad and I've made at work who plays rugby, he's the same and he's like, we play for three, four months of the year, that's it, we enjoy the rest of the year until the next one comes around and, you know, I think it's a lot more difficult now to sell that, John, to sell to a lad uh, that's mine are coming up to play with Leitrim. Here you are. Um, we're going to start the gym in October with you now, and your F- first FBD game isn't for four months. And they're going to be okay. And then when you know, and then we'll still be we'll still be training next July or August, and we won't be anywhere near the Sam Maguire. So likewise in club, I think that's happening a little bit more. I don't know what you do to 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 sort it. You know what happened, John? We actually ended up having a lot of lads came back for the club last year because it was a short turnaround in the year, and I think. Yeah. COVID- opened everybody's eyes to maybe the GEA doing a total split in the calendar. Now, you can't be expecting county players to go for 12 months, but mm. something needs to happen. We we all spoke last year about oh how great it was and just a quick championship and the pressure was off lads and lads could have a point. But um, where where is that gone? That's been completely forgotten. 
do you know it's been completely forgotten about so i think there's something in that if it was looked into a little bit more and no more than the structures of the champion yeah. and everything that goes with it you know yeah, and I suppose last thing on it, guys, because I know better man to ask, obviously you were involved with county panel for so long at this stage, but has it got to a stage where players maybe are playing in county panels because they feel they maybe need to, they're kind of, you know, they're doing it because others are doing it or they're kind of doing it to tick, tick a few boxes. Like, has it got to a stage where lads are just feeling like they're nearly forced to do it or do they actually want to do it, I suppose, guys? Yeah, and I think you'll have seen that. Um some lads, I think that the modern day footballer, if he's not getting a return fairly quick, John, he'll end up leaving a panel or he might jump off a panel. And I think if they're not in and, and playing straight away, there's no real patience there anymore with a younger guy to kind of hang around the panel. And that may also be an issue with the turnover on Leitrim at the moment and with Terry and the boys. But um, I think so. I think back in the day, we, we had to do two or three years of, of, of gym work and, and building ourselves up in order to even get a get a 15 minute cameo off the bench for Leitrim or for, for our club team. So the thing is now, if you come in and you're talented enough, you want to play straight away. And when you put it down there in black and white, John, it is crazy when you consider the time scales, um, you know, 70, 80 sessions a year for maybe 10 club games or even county games. I mean, it doesn't actually make sense when you put it down on paper like so. I think younger, younger lads are clever enough and smart enough now to figure that out for themselves. And they're saying, yeah. this isn't the be-all and end-all. Whereas when we were coming up, it was the be-all and end-all. And I think yeah. county players are the same. If you're coming through minor in 21, you you know that you, you have to follow this path in order to get better and to, to get playing and do your gym work. But nowadays, lads are being plugged from club championships and things. And I don't think they understand the work that needs to go into it. So uh, the rewards aren't there for the work that goes into it, John. And I think a lot of guys are... are able to figure that out a little bit better now yeah definitely i suppose and it's just interesting because obviously with eric lowne stepping away and paul manny stepping away and like you know maybe i know paul manny was periphery of the double panel last year them stepping away so it just does go to show te- dublin are nearly used as a template and they've won all the all Ireland titles they've won all their Leinster titles but you've lads stepping away gary so it's just a very interesting topic to discuss and i suppose to wrap it up guys who would be your uh, player to watch this weekend and your bet of the weekend player to watch this weekend um he's the wing back for Kildare I think Kevin Flynn is his name um I've seen him playing his, his father is from Leitrim <laughs> believe it or not so I don't know how we didn't strike there quick enough uh, I think it's Kevin Flynn now if I'm wrong I'm sure I get pulled up on it but he plays wing back for Kildare I think he was out injured I read an article on him a few weeks ago where his parents are from Leitrim or his father is from Leitrim so I know that he's billed as being a very good player um, he lit up the league as well from wing back he's always good for a score so um, I'd watch out for him um, good player what are the other games we're looking at John Tyrone Donegal we know them all in them ones um, Armagh obviously Rory Grugan you know I, I would like to kind of get a bit of an unknown couple of players but um, the one I'd be looking out for is Flynn for, for Kildare or Jimmy Highland in the corner those two um, me bet for the weekend me, you know, I was going to say need but <laughs> <laughs> it's not much to pick from. I suppose I've called Kildare to win it, but uh, yeah, my bet for the weekend would maybe be Armagh to beat Monaghan. It's not much of a bet because those games are very even, John, so I suppose I can't give, give uh, let me see, what would you say? Um, yeah, that's that's a bit about it for me, mate. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Guys, all very hard games to yeah. call, but all games are really, really looking forward to this weekend and we cannot wait for because I think this weekend is hopefully the saviour of a very dour championship as we speak, Gary. But Gary, thanks a million for joining me this week. And of course, this podcast is sponsored by yorkoretro.com. Use the promo code JMAC Podcast to get 15% off on their website. And as you can see, Gary, hopefully he's sporting that uh, lovely leech from the early. He's going to show up. So if you have any interest in that... This week, John. <laughs> if you have any interest in that, use the promo code to get 15% off on it. And I'll get Gary to sign it for you and all. So we'll, he'll hopefully <laughs> no problem doing that, maybe. <laughs> Gary, t- uh, thanks a million. And uh, enjoy Love Island tonight. Yes, <laughs> thanks for that much, mate. Getting it done early. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, sir. Thanks very much. Cheers, man.